Hello, everybody. Today's topic is two topics, actually. It's going to be soil issues and then also precision agriculture. And we are into our final topics for introductory to soil science. So uh, our first soil um, issue that we want to think about or um, kind of address is the idea of soil erosion. So there's two main types of soil erosion, um, or sorry, there's two main causes of soil erosion, wind and water. Um, in the, uh, when you're, when you're thinking about soil erosion and you want to put it into the context of the soil that we've learned it so far, um, it's really a loss of topsoil. So the A horizon is the one that'll disappear, uh, through wind or water erosion. And then, um, when that happens, your B horizon is much less productive. And so... We talked, we've talked in this class about the idea that the A horizon's got um, a lot of organic matter in it and most plants only really root about six inches into the soil and that's mostly into that topsoil layer. So when you lose topsoil, it becomes very, um, very hard to be, for the plants to be efficient and your productivity goes way down. Um, in terms of agricultural productivity, it's an average of about 15%. Uh, you got about 2 billion tons of topsoil uh, lost uh, in the U.S. yearly. And um, in terms of geological erosion, so that's erosion that's happened over a long period of time. That's inevitable. Things like um, the forming of the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. That's a good example of geological erosion. Just wind and water for long, long millions of years. And then, um, and then you get that formation to happen. Um, some of the, the, uh, Arches National Park in Utah, that's another great example of geological erosion. No, this long form, uh, version of erosion. But the accelerated erosion, the erosion that we, uh, that you, you think of mostly when you think of soil erosion, that, uh, it happens, um, much more rapidly and it's uh much more avoidable it's a it's a anthropogenic or human caused problem um it's it's a problem for both wind um wind and water erosion in terms of accelerated uh and it really depends on your farming practices because your your practices will really um help define what it is you're going to do about soil and how um how you what problems you'll have with soil erosion and how you're then going to deal with them so uh in terms of uh why is erosion a problem it's because you'll you'll get soil degradation now you can get soil degradation through overgrazing or deforestation or um bad agricultural practices um, urbanization or really some sort of um, some sort of uh, combination of all of those things um, about 60 percent of degraded land um, has suffered uh, vegetative degradation but the soil is not seriously impaired um, and then most uh, most soils are only slightly or moderately de degraded and could be restored with local financial and technical investments and so um, one of the big things to understand, especially with the accelerated erosion, is that um, it's not, it's usually not a permanent thing. It's something that can be fixed and really only becomes problematic if it's not dealt with and not thought about. Um, and so that's, that's what we're talking about here where we say it's the idea that it's mostly slightly or moderately degraded. It's not um, extremely degraded. Uh, so it's, it's something that can be dealt with if you choose to deal with it. If you choose to ignore it, it can become a huge problem. So an example I like to use a lot is um, out in Georgia. They have a state park um, called Providence Canyon State Park. And it is, um, Georgia thinks of it as a natural wonder and, um, and kind of gives it 
a nice distinction. But what it actually is, is it's bad agricultural farming practices from the 1900s ended up um, creating so much soil erosion that they ended up with this huge canyon um, where they lost tons of soil and they, it's, they've got these huge gullies and, and, and um, just so much soil moved away that it ended up um, kind of becoming this, this beautiful park that you could walk through and see all this soil erosion, but just, um, just not the way that you want to end up having a state park. So the first um, part of erosion we're going to focus on is water erosion. And when we look at this picture, you can see um, that normally that that picture of all that farmland should just kind of just keep going across. But then we've got that area right there in the middle where the land has, has channeled basically because of the water erosion coming off of that watershed. So um, we're going to break down water erosion into um, three types. Uh, we'll call it droplets, water flow, and water accumulates. So droplets, uh, we're talking about erosion by rainfall or sprinklers, where you get um, small soil particle detachment. Water flow, that's where you're getting the water moving um, as a group over the soil surface and causing what's called sheet erosion, which is, uh, you can see, on the right hand side of this picture. That's the movement of soil um, in a unit. We call that sheet erosion. And then water accumulates, um, that's when you get rills or gullies. A rill is just a smaller version of a gully. So if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see uh, in the background, you'll kind of see the, um, the path that that sheet took where you, you're like, oh, it's like a little um, channel almost that's been formed. That's a rill. And if that rill just keeps going and getting bigger and getting bigger and getting bigger, it'll eventually become a, a gully. Uh, side note, my last name is Arroyo, and that's actually a Spanish word for, uh, for a dry creek or a creek with no um, water in it or what other people call a gully. Um, fine sands and silts are the most sensitive of our soils to uh, water erosion. And the number one problem for, uh, or sorry, the number one cause of um, water erosion um, happening is the idea that there is a lack of appropriate plant cover. And then a big thing to understand is how problematic water erosion can be because it's um, about 22 to $90 billion a year in terms of the damage that it causes. And so it's really something that um, farmers want to pay attention to, really something that can be problematic if um, not dealt with. Because it's something that you, you as somebody who is taking care of the land and being a steward of the land should understand is going to be problematic and be able to deal with it before it becomes a major problem. So um, in terms of this droplet uh, droplet water erosion that we I mentioned on the previous slide. There's three big parts of it. So there's the idea of detachment, transport, and deposition. So as the water hits the ground, if you look at uh, the figure on the right, as the water hits the ground, it's going to um, impact onto the ground. And that's um, impact happens at about 30 miles an hour. It's then going to loosen uh, especially the, the silts and the fine sands in the soil. And so that's what we call detachment, that loosening of that, of that soil. And then the, um, it'll either, it'll, because of the impact, then be transported somewhere else. Um, clays are, are, have a strong particle attachment, so they're not usually going to detach all that much. Sands are, are pretty heavy, so, um, they might not detach as far off the ground. They might only kind of roll along the ground. Um, but then um, they'll transport to then a new spot where they'll, where they'll be deposited. So you've got detachment, transport, and deposition as our three um, parts of the process of water erosion. 
And so the pictures we see here is uh, what a wheat field looks like after a damaging rain, a, a strong heavy rain. And you can see kind of how beat down the, uh, the wheat is and how much water has gone into that system and how you could start to see that um, if, if you were going to end up with um, maybe a rill um, in this sort of an area, you can kind of see like where the channel would start to go because you can see where the water was flowing when when it was heavier. In terms of the whole world, um, you've got you got this idea of water erosion vulnerability. So where where is water erosion going to be problematic? And you can see when you look at this chart, if you said, well, where are all the farmlands? in the world you're pretty much looking at, at a similar map and so you can kind of see that those um, those farmlands uh, are for the most part uh, moderate a lot of yellow out there um, definitely a few areas where it's high and the few areas where it's high um, they're they're in areas where you know water is water scarcity is going to be uh, just as much of a driver as water erosion. So how do we deal with water erosion? So uh, the, one of the first ways is the idea of terraces. So those are relatively large strips of land on slopes made either flat or shallower than the slopes with dikes. And so what you're basically doing is you're, you're stair-stepping the land as much as you can. So in this picture on the right, you're going to see that there it says contour terrace. So that's where we're going to be planting our um, planting our crop. We've got our grass waterway, so we know the area where the water is going to flow. So we've made it to where the we just left that alone, and we're going to let the water flow out. And then we've also created these channels in between our stair steps where water can also flow and that way we can maximize the amount of um, land that we farm while still knowing that we're going to deal with this water erosion problem and kind of giving the water a place to go as opposed to trying to to fight with it and that's that's the idea of contour cropping so we're gonna um, we're gonna use the contours of the land or the natural um, differences in elevation and we're just gonna um, let the water um, go down the slope and let gravity take its course without hopefully affecting our crop. So another way is to just make contour strips. So we had our terraces before, the kind of the wider patches, whereas the contour strips are just strips of intensive uh, crops with sod on the contours. And you can see a couple examples of that, and it's not quite the same as the as the terracing before, but just the idea of making a couple contour strips as opposed to um, full out stair stepping it. And so on the bottom here, it says that the arrows are indicating that waterway. So once again, we know the idea that we want water to, or water is going to be an issue on this land, but we don't want it to be an issue for the crop. So we're creating that waterway to let the water go through, let gravity take its course, and hopefully not affect our uh, crop. Contour tillage, so having the crops grow in rows along the contour, very much the same idea where we're, um, we're making sure we're following the contours, we're uh, knowing the problem that we're going to have, and we're kind of trying to just decrease that flow of water. Gravity here is the big issue, and so with this one, you can see that we haven't created those waterways for the um, for the water to flow down through, but what we've done is we've definitely made sure that we've got our um, our contours in place to where hopefully we can let that water erosion slow down enough to where it won't cause a huge issue. And then the other part is filter strips, so strips of grass at the ends of fields to prevent sediment from entering in the stream. So. In this example here, we've got these grassy strips, and we're leaving those to basically, that's the area where we want the water to, to funnel into, and we want the water to just kind of work its way out to hopefully not pollute our streams 
and still leave room for us to grow our crops. But um, the one thing we addressed uh, a few slides ago and said was the number one cause for um, problematic water erosion is the idea of inadequate uh, cover crops. And so we definitely want to make sure we have cover crops growing. So we want to have um, thick canopy crops grown between trees and vines during the fallow season. So you can see in these pictures, not just the idea of the crop that we're growing for um, uh, for our economic base, but also putting something, some sort of a cover crop, whether it's just grass or um, or wheat or or we're alternating crops or any of that, whatever we choose to do, just having some sort of cover crop on the on the soil so it's not just bare soil where it's exposed and can really be um, taken advantage of by water or uh, wind erosion. Because one of the things we'd really like to avoid is um, soil sediments or soil sedimentation into our waterways. Um, they can fill reservoirs, uh, they can reduce the sunlight uh, penetration in water which makes it hard for uh, the aquatic life to um, get the right oxygen content because you won't have photosynthesis happening within the water. Um, it can end up covering good soil with soil that's been eroded. It can raise riverbeds which then start getting into your um, getting into water um, flow, water depth, water velocity issues, and then they can also carry pollutants uh, with them. And so those are all kind of problems we'd like to avoid that soil sedimentation can cause. Another thing we'd like to uh, avoid is the idea of creating too much runoff. So we talked about surface runoff before as the idea of the water not getting into the soil. It's the stuff that runs off the top. So you can see in the picture here on the left that without control you get a lot of soil erosion and you get a lot of sediment uh, being carried away that's then going to end up somewhere and, and cause problems. But if we um, use some sort of a control, some sort of um, waterway created through um, terracing or contour farming, then the water is just going to run clear. It's not going to um, tear up the soil and it's not going to be as problematic. So we're going to concentrate that runoff into certain areas to make sure that since it's going to happen anyways, we're going to make sure it's, um, it's happening, but it's not going to be a, um, a very big problem that it would be if we did not concentrate the runoff. Our other form of erosion is wind erosion. And you can see from this picture here that it can be quite problematic. And once again, the idea of cover crops being an issue. When it's bare soil, it's really easy for that soil to, to pick up and go. But if we have something on the soil, that will at least uh, help, help out and be, um, be somewhat of a uh, stopgap for the problem. So, in terms of controlling wind erosion, we want to keep fallow land wet during the wind season, windy season. So, if we're not going to have um, something planted on the land or it's not the right time for our crop, that's okay. But the land needs to be kept wet. The soil needs to be wet so it, it sticks together, it's heavy, and it doesn't want to go anywhere. Um, the other idea is to use cover crops. So, even if you're not um, planting anything, during say you you grow um, spring crops and you've got nothing happening in the winter maybe you're just going to plant something in the winter there just to make sure that the soil is then ready for you come springtime um, you can till the land to produce clods so the idea that we're going to get the soil to kind of um, come together in these bigger um, bigger particles so that it'll it'll stick together better and not want to erode away um, you can also have tillage that makes uh, ridges or rows perpendicular to the major wind direction. So if I've got my wind coming in this way, then I can put in rows like that, and that's going to break up that wind and not let it be as strong and as much of a problem if my crops and my wind were all going in the same direction. 
And then the idea of windbreaks. So using either um, shrubs or tall grass or trees even um, to then uh, decrease the amount of wind that is able to to hit your field. Um, it can increase crop yields uh, by up to a fifth um, in terms of um, just really slowing down that wind and being able to allow more topsoil to stay in that area. And it can be uh, extremely beneficial for insects and birds because there's more wildlife habitat out there on the land where there wasn't before. So uh, definitely windbreaks are a positive in terms of controlling wind erosion. Uh, these two maps here, we're looking at our vulnerability to water erosion and our vulnerability to wind erosion. And you can see, so we've got our areas that are popular for agriculture. And we can see here, for the most part, um, your areas that are, that are vulnerable to water erosion uh, and areas that are vulnerable to wind erosion got a lot of similar characteristics. However, there's a couple areas that really differ. So um, the Great Plains of, the, um, of North America, you can see for our water erosion here, they've got uh, moderate to low and then for our wind erosion you can see it's it's mostly it's mostly moderate because they do have they do have some wind erosion issues um, for water erosion on the eastern um, part of the United States you've got um, high and very high areas whereas for wind erosion the winds not quite an issue in terms of um, the eastern United States. It's much wetter, much more humid, much more problems to um, water than they are than there are to wind. And you can see um, some other trends like that in certain areas. So um, eastern Asia, you can see that uh, very, very much problems in um, the areas around China with water erosion, whereas not so much of a problem with, with wind erosion in that area. Uh, in terms of the wind erosion problem, about 42% of the total U.S. Um, erosion problem is wind erosion. So it's it's almost all in the western United States because it's dry and not humid. Uh, Nevada uses loses 22 tons per acre a year, and Wyoming is around 21 tons per acre a year. And remember, that's of topsoil getting uh, pulled up and and disappearing and moving somewhere else. Uh, what's interesting to me is semi-arid regions are worse than arid regions because there's more agricultural use. So you think that arid would be arid or the one the places that are the most dry would have the worst wind erosion problem. But because they're so dry, you, people don't actually do farming there. But the semi-arid areas, that's good enough for them to do farming. But then because of that and because it being semi-arid, you end up having a huge problem with wind erosion more than you actually end up with in the in the arid areas. Uh, humus and silt uh, can remain in the air. Uh, sands will undergo saltation. So that's the idea of it kind of um, jumping around a little bit because it's heavy, so it can't get lifted up off the ground, whereas um, silts and humus will become what you think of as dust in the air. And so um, when you hear about the Dust Bowl uh, during the 1930s and how a lot of people ended up moving from the Great Plains from Kansas and Oklahoma and actually settling in the Bakersfield area, that whole problem was due to a big drought followed by some um, not efficient uh, agricultural practices. And then the, um, the normal wind erosion that they have in that area got kicked up for a few years Plus all of that ended up being where basically all the topsoil from the Great Plains agricultural areas just disappeared and was blown away. And so wind erosion can be a huge problem. It's a problem that they know is going to continually happen in the Great Plains. And you, they know that because you've got the, the mountains where you can get some of these cold fronts and bring in these huge winds, but then you've got nothing in the way. There's no trees. There's no topography it's just flat land with a lot of grass so there's nothing stopping the wind from blowing as hard as it can so they know they're going to have problems in the great plains with wind erosion they just have to find 
better, better and efficient um, ways of farming to deal with it. And then one other piece of wind erosion is this idea of desert pavement. So desert pavement, um, the idea of how does desert pavement occur, and you've got a picture of it up there on the top right. So you've got deflation, which is the removal by wind of loose sand, silt, and clay particles. Then over time, you got larger pebbles concentrated at the surface as the sand, silt, and clay particles are removed. And then the larger pebbles start um, fitting tightly together and become this this sort of desert pavement where basically the the smaller soils and all the things that could move and could um, could be uh, sent off into the in the wind that's all been moved and what you got left is these bigger these bigger harder pieces and definitely not um, something in terms of a soil that is uh, of a really uh, good use to us. So, um, just looking at the overall idea of soil pollution as well, there's lots of ways you can get pollution through mining or through um, accelerated through our household waste, waste and plastics or through erosion or bad agricultural practices. Um, specific examples of our soil pollution problem, um, excess fertilizers, that's a big one in terms of uh, the dead zone and the at the uh, at the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River with all the things that are all the different um, businesses and agricultural practices and um, factories and things that are right along the Mississippi River. Um, there's so much waste and so much fertilizer and pesticides and all those things that um, end up downstream that that there's a huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mississippi where nothing can live anymore because of uh, eutrophication. Uh, you also have pesticides, wastewaters, solid waste, things like sludge, manure, garbage, those, those sorts of things, natural toxins, soluble salts, soil sediments, all these things that, that um, contribute to soil pollution. And you can see in the table here on the right, uh, the different kinds of in impacts and the annual cost in millions. In terms of fertilizers, um, the two the two big ones um, that leach uh, the most easily are nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, phosphorus can cause algal blooms in the water. Um, they're usually not too toxic, but they can be, and so that's that's that problem of eutrophication that I mentioned earlier. And eutrophication is just the idea that um, excess nutrient loading into a water body will then um, cause algal blooms and those algal blooms then prevent photosynthesis from happening and they basically suck up all the oxygen and create a hypoxic situation. So basically they suck out all the oxygen or use up all the oxygen in the um, water and then the fish or the plant life or whatever else was there. Uh, nothing can live. And then ultimately, if you get a big enough um, version of that and have it happening over a large area, that's what then is called a dead zone, um, much like the one I just discussed at the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River. And so um, a big thing to understand is um, with nitrogen, having nitrates leach into the groundwater, um, they can be poisonous if you have them uh, at a level greater than 45 parts per million. So if you get nit nitrates in your soil at greater than 45 parts per million, it's poisonous and um, is a real problem for the groundwater. So um, where where are the nitrate sources here in the U.S.? So about 37% of it's from soil humus, 22% from human and animal uh, manures or excrement. 18% is fixed by bacteria and algae. You get about 13% of it from your fertilizers, and then 10% of your nitrate comes from rainfall. In terms of pesticides, you've got uh, millions of tons applied annually to the U.S. in crops. Uh, I think a lot of us um, here in the Central Valley are used to uh, seeing the idea of um, crop dusters and, and the idea of herbicide being um, 
broadcasted from from above. Uh, that's kind of a normal way that we see pesticides being applied uh, in this area. Um, farmers cause most herbicide contamination. Homeowners uh, end up causing the most insecticide contamination because um, homeowners are much more likely to use just a base gold insecticide, whereas the farmers are more concerned with the uh, competition between plants. So they, they're using herbicides. Uh, danger, the danger is pollution of the water and um, of long-term soil pollution. So farmers want to um, plant crops, make money, um, take care of the land, but uh, in order to do that, they're going to use uh, they're going to use pesticides, and knowing that that you're using something that's harmful can it can be harmful to the water, so you have to be really cognizant of that. And it can be harmful to the soil and all the things living in the soil because it's that it's a large, um, really complex functioning ecosystem. So you have to really, really be careful and really understand what you're doing. Um, New pesticides have short to no life in the soil and they're less toxic to humans, so we're becoming much more effective with figuring out the right combination of pesticides. Um, but the biggest uh, cause of pollution is the idea of improper application, either not knowing the right way to get it um, onto the crop or um, putting too much or um, not uh, applying it in an efficient way, but just some sort of improper application problem. With our, our organic waste, uh, some, some big ideas with organic waste, sewer water, uh, sewer sludge, and sludge just being the idea of not even knowing. It's the combination of all those things, uh, livestock manure, and then just municipal garbage, which we still um, have um, dumps and still just bury into the soil. So remember anytime um, you're throwing things away or anytime you're taking something to the dump, remember what is actually happening there. That stuff is getting buried into the ground and we're hoping that the ground can uh, handle it and have it not be an issue. So we really are causing a problem to that local ecosystem ecosystem. Uh, natural soluble salts can also be a problem. Um, big, uh, big problem with uh, sodium chloride and clay dispersion, things that we've talked about in previous chapters. Uh, this picture on the right here shows um, what a couple blind sheep look like as well as having these um, like salt, alkaline disease, salt deformities in their hooves. Um, the ones that are um, problematic that we've discussed before, selenium, arsenic, boron, molybdenum. Selenium being a huge problem here in the um, San Joaquin Valley, um, but boron also being um, quite toxic. And then um, the soluble salts, this is an issue with the western United States. It's not really something that, that gets dealt with um, east of the Mississippi. With precision agriculture, um, what do we mean by that terminology? It's the idea of really just incorporating technology into, uh, into farming and being able to use these different things to make farming more efficient, which is something we've talked about throughout the semester, that it's really important if we could um, emphasize uh, becoming better and much more efficient with our farming practice. And so um, popular precision farming applications, um, the use of GPS, uh, the use of uh, meal, uh, yield, monitoring, yield monitoring, um, sensing, um, usually remote sensing, um, the idea of, of um, bringing in satellites or bringing in um, um, aerial imagery to help, help us um, figure out any sort of issues we're having. Um, some sort of application control, uh, the use of a GIS system. So uh, the first one to talk about is the idea of GPS. So GPS is looking to measure location. Um, the accuracy can vary with the equipment. So um, it's kind of one of those things where uh, more bang for your buck. If you're paying a lot, you're probably getting a very accurate system. And if you're not paying 
a whole lot of money, you're probably not getting uh, the accuracy that you could get if you bought a better system. Uh, it's usually independent of weather, although there are some situations because the signal's coming from a satellite that could be problematic. Um, what's really nice is when using a GPS, you can get immediate results. It can be inexpensive depending on um, the accuracy that you need. And currently there's 31 satellites in orbit um, and there's 27 uh, that are actually operational. Uh, the satellites uh, use triangulation, and they're used as um, they use uh, they're used as reference points, and while also using um, other known reference points on the ground, and then they they triangulate your position. Um, the GPS receiver times how long it takes the signal to go um, from the satellite and back, and that's how it calculates the the distance. And then you need at least four satellites to um, to compute a three-dimensional position and when we say three-dimensional we're saying latitude longitude and altitude altitude or x y and z but basically being able to say exactly where you are and then also at what elevation you're at in terms of uh, using a gis system usually that's um, incorporating uh, gps data but a gis system is a collection of spatial data so it's a collection of different locations, which we can see on the right here um, with our, our little uh, red dots, but then also attributes. So finding different things out about. So here's a, um, in this example on the right here, there's a layer that shows the um, um, watershed uh, in the area. And then you probably have a layer um, that might tell you the soils in the area, or you have your layer that gives you the outline of your farm boundary and you overlay all these layers and make these overlay maps to show these different factors and then you can do uh, spatial analysis to interpolate between your measured points and um, see what else you might want to come up with so there's all sorts of different ideas that you may want to look at um, the the kind of the bigger issue or the bigger deal with using G GIS is the idea that it can ha um, help farmers adapt to different variables. So you can monitor the health of crops or you can estimate yields or you can try and maximize crop production. So if you know this is an area, like with this picture on the left, if I know that this area over here, there's it's not getting enough water, then I can increase my irrigation efficiency for that area. Or if I know I'm not getting uh, the yield out of that air, these yellow areas as I am getting in these green areas well then what do I need to differently in these yellow areas do I have a nutrient deficiency or is there a different type of soil or you start kind of figuring out um, these issues and then you can start really diagnosing the problem uh, if you have different soil layers if you know wind direction rainfall amounts the more information you have and the more information you can put together the more useful the GIS is going to be. The more information in the system, plus all these locations, makes it to where you can really start um, really assessing your site well and really helping helping bridge that gap to getting to um, higher efficiency and this idea of precision agriculture. Uh, here's a example of GIS. So we can see the picture on the right. And then um, putting a, a few GIS layers together, uh, we can see a spatial distribution of nitrogen within the soil. So we can see areas where we have a lot of nitrogen and areas where we have little bits of nitrogen. And um, you can see in some of these areas, you've got orange and you've got the, the darker burnt orange. And we said nitrogen, having nitrate in the soil, um, up above 45 is really problematic so we've got some areas that are heavy in nitrogen and some areas that are lower in nitrogen so once we decide that we're going to apply fertilizer to this land now we know the areas that are really going to need some nitrogen and then um, areas that we definitely do not want to put any more nitrogen into the soil otherwise we might cause a problem um, one one of the layers that we can use or its own um, something that actually is its own GIS system 
is the um, web soil survey, which is provided by the um, United States Department of Agriculture and uh, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, a soil survey is a systematic examination, description, classification, and mapping of the soils in a given area. And what uh, USDA NRCS has done is they put all these, which used to be a series of books, they've now put it together as a um, GIS system on the internet uh, where you can go on and you can look up your soils and see um, how they, what different soils you have and all the different classifications and all the information you can um, think of or want to know, the erosion um, potential, the amount of clay, sand, silt in your soils, all sorts of things. But we've had a little bit of example are uh, a little bit of uh, of uh, use of a similar system which we have here in California called Soil Web, which was developed by UC Davis uh, in conjunction with the USDA, and that's um, that was made more as a phone app where we use the GPS location, um, but it's still the same idea: be able to tell us what soils we have, what does the profile look like, what's the pH what's the erosion potential, all, all the information we, we would want to know about our soils. And the whole idea with any of these is just the idea is that we're just trying to, um, we're trying to improve our land. We're trying to improve our efficiency. We want to make um, farming not be problematic because it's something we need. A lot of people rely on farming. A lot of people um, need, need farming and for sustainability and with our understanding of ecosystems and understanding of soil and the role soil plays within farming and the role soil plays just in sustainability on this planet if we can improve farming and we can take better care of our soil that's going to be better for everyone and so just like always want to leave you with a few um, questions here just to kind of keep your um, Keep your mind going, keep your head in the game, and just um, kind of give you something to, to think about as we finish up this topic. Hope you enjoyed it.